Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is, wherever you are. My name is Anish DeVos and we have, drum rolling there for you, Mr. David Buckler, who I'm just going to give him one word again, but this time energetic, because David, you gave yourself that a couple of shows back and I know that you are particularly excited, not just me, about our guests. David, Absolutely. would you like to introduce our guest? Because you are particularly excited. Um, Lucy, this is Lucy. Is it Johnstone, Lucy, or Johnston? Uh, either. Either. Okay. Well, you know, Johnstone. Yeah. It's it's happening it's, uh, on the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, uh, Lucy Johnston. And we're going to touch on, I think, um, working around diagnosis or um, not diagnosis, as the case may be. Um, working around uh, the Power Threat Meanings Framework, uh, which is co-authored. Um, and it's something that's uh, by Lucy, and it's been driven uh, by Lucy, um, as far as I'm aware, but she'll um, give us more information upon that. And also, we may well be touching upon on, um, her views on electroconvulsive therapy, I hope, which is another oh. subject that's dear to my heart. <laughs> Um, there's a lot to it's cram in. Here all day. <laughs> yeah, um, and although, you know, there may be brief visits, um, I'm looking forward to Lucy's insight. Thank you. Lovely to be here. So I'm open to any questions. Well, I have got one for you. <clears throat> Lucy, how does somebody who is a clinical psychologist, you know, you're a speaker, you're a writer, how did you get involved with this idea that let's get rid of this diagnosis. Let's start asking, you know, what is it that happened to you? How did you get into getting people to tell their story? How did that happen for you? How did that happen? Um, well, I, it's a long, long time ago since I went into the career of clinical psychology, which is, mm. I've never regretted, has been a very good one for me, but I mean, unlike some people, I think people come to these perspectives from you know different paths. Unlike some people, I never believed anything different. And so I hadn't, didn't have a kind of revelation, didn't start thinking perhaps all this stuff is wrong. I always at a very instinctive level felt it was wrong. And that's rooted in, I mean, partly in my own experiences of distress, to be honest. I was a kind of unhappy child, an unhappy teenager, an unhappy young woman and so on. But okay. partly through I mean, a, a really unhealthily early interest in reading psychology and psychotherapy books. There happened to be a lot lying around in my family home for all sorts of reasons. And I was reading them for about the age of 12 onwards. And I'm of the generation that was, you know, books by Lang were around and my university friends had read Lang and you know, she came did a seminar when I was at university once. So those ideas were around. And so I, I never thought that there was such a thing as a kind of mental illness. And it always seemed perfectly obvious to me from all sorts of angles that people are distressed for reasons in their lives. Mm, absolutely. Much a theme of my, my whole career really, which has manifested itself in, in kind of different ways. And Lucy, I follow you on Twitter. <laughs> you get a oh lot dear. of stick. <laughs> no, I, I literally, I am the one that retweets you, and among the millions of others. Um, but you get a lot of stick for what you say. Don't I, you? I, I get a hell of a lot of stick. Yes, I mean, not just me, not just me. No. There are some favourite targets on Twitter of who I seem, who I seem to be one. And I don't, I don't quite get it, to be honest. I mean, I think, you know, I'm presenting points of view that are challenging to some people. A lot of people disagree with them. I mean, I hope I always make it clear that nobody has to agree with me, but some of the backlash appears to come from a position, not just I disagree with you, or I disagree with you quite profoundly, which is fine, but you should not be saying these things. And it often comes with a distinct side side helping of misogyny as well I and mean, the yeah. kind of things that have been said to me about me are quite disgraceful yeah. often from you know professionals tweeting under their own names so it, 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 it you know it, it's very unpleasant at times and I guess one of the ways I manage it is by thinking well you know my psychologist hat on what's this about <laughs> yes. it's really not about the arguments because if 
any given discussion quickly degenerates into personal, often sexist insults, then there's something else going on other than a kind of rational evidence-based discussion. Mm. But I do think, to coin a rather um, cliched term, that we are on the, we're in a kind of paradigm shift state at the moment. Um, yeah. You know, we are, I think, witnessing the crumbling of a diagnostic model that has dominated you know, for so actually not for in some ways not for that long but sort of for over a hundred years in yeah. most societies and yeah. if you read the stuff about paradigm shifts then they are heralded by a great deal of resistance a great deal of upheaval a great deal of backlash so actually in some ways this is a good sign this is a good sign but i mean i i do waste too much time on twitter and <laughs> it's not a pleasant environment as you will <clears throat> yourself for the yeah. moment, it has more advantages than disadvantages to me because it's a very, very good way of making connections. I've made some fabulous connections and friends and allies through Twitter, mm. and it's been a fantastic medium to spread ideas, to advertise conferences, books, links to articles, and so on. Yeah, and some of the ones that I am I'm particularly passionate about is Mad in America, Mad in the UK, and a disorder for everyone, which is. I see you around there a lot, Lucy, around those. <laughs> so would you like to tell us a little bit more about a disorder for everyone? Because I think the thing I love about it is you just feel that, <clears throat> that when anything comes out from there, and I've been, been to the festival um, last September of last year now, isn't it? That it just feels as though the language that is used is just real everyday language. And that's what people that, that watch, you know, community connections actually really appreciate, that it is just this very straightforward terms that people use. And just this, also this huge care and compassion for people as well. Well, yeah, this is one of the things that came through Twitter, actually. I mean, I must pay tribute to the main organiser, Joe Watson, who's a yeah. psychotherapist, who's initiated, who is the driving force behind organising these events. But we met on Twitter. And in fact, the very first time we met face to face was October 2016 in Birmingham, the very first A Disorder for Everyone event. <laughs> we had no idea what this was going to be like or who we were or how it was going to go down. Yeah. But that was a first event where we put together a whole day of kind of talks and workshops and right from the start poetry as well and mm. people from the creative arts scene which is essentially about challenging the biomedical model of distress and yep. promoting trauma-informed and narrative-based um, approaches instead so in a nutshell instead of asking what's wrong with you or what's wrong with me ask what's happened to me definitely Day was a great success. It had fantastic feedback. We have since gone on to put on, I think we were, did our 23rd event just before lockdown. Wow. So we've been all over the country and we've been to Cardiff several times and uh, Edinburgh several times. We did have ambitious plans to go further afield and then lockdown happened. Mm. And in each of those events, the same, the themes are the same, the core messages, and you're right, we try to make it, you know, we are very, very particular about language. This is about ordinary language descriptions of very difficult experiences that many people have, which can be described in simple, ordinary language terms, essentially. We don't need this diagnostic job, we need any professional job, and in fact, and we have a very good mixture, I think, of professionals, academics, researchers, and, you know, sometimes these are the same people, of course, people may have dual identities, but mm -hmm. also service users, survivors, and there's nothing that brings a day to life like a really powerful poetry performance by someone about their own experience or a testimony from someone like Jackie Dillon about how she escaped the psychiatric system and yeah. so on. And the atmosphere is usually fantastic, as you will know, and, you yeah. know, very intense, very moving, usually ends up with a lot of drinking at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, lockdown at first seemed, you know, a significant hindrance. But in fact, again, thanks to Joe's energy, we've been able to take um, a disorder, everyone online, as you know. So last yeah. September we had, my goodness, this was a big thing to do. I think it was 14 hours online, mm. which yeah. ran for 9am to about 11pm 
at which time we were all pretty tired. <laughs> very generously by online events, John Wilson from online events. And this time we were able to have speakers from all over the world and we were able to reach people from all over the world. I think we had 3,000 people tune in from 18 countries. So yeah. something that was initially seemed like a hindrance was turned into a, a you know, a really interesting way of building on what, what we already have. And yeah. I would mention that on September the 17th, we're doing the festival all over again. Yes, I'm booked. <laughs> if you go on, very good. If you go on the website, it's a disorder for everyone, figure four, yeah. com, you will see that. And you will also see that we have another thing we've developed over lockdown, which is regular poetry evenings, which is a mixture of established performance poets and other people perhaps you know, raising their voices for the first time, all on a theme of mental health, which is not a term I like. And, no, we uh, don't either. Good, I think we agree on that. And um, that's on the next one, on April the 16th. Yes, um, and um, David particularly doesn't like the term mental health. And so glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, gets extremely ranty about it. Normally I'm the ranter, but when we say the word mental health, I literally, it's like swiping an app, David, just that's when you get energetic isn't it David so I'm gonna hand over that term to you I'm always a emotional distress but David why do you hate the term mental health so much here we go we're gonna light it for him I, I, I think it's um it's open for too much interpretation it, it sounds clinical um just just saying the words mm. um and it's when I read things on Facebook, like, um, I have mental health. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, I guess we all do, um, good or bad. But um, it's sort of, it, it's a banner for the medicalization of, of what I do, particularly it's the medicalization of emotional distress. And that's why I dislike it. it, it it's um, it's well-meaning, um, I guess. Uh, everybody knows what it means, um, but I think it's indicative of the introduction of the medical language into everyday use. Um, yeah. So, you know, as a psychotherapist, I'll, I will be told by a client or prospective client that what they know what they have, or they think they know what they have. And that's to be respected but it's always described in medical terms. And that's why, in a nutshell, um, without taking it too much time, is, is why I don't like the term. Well, I totally, totally agree with you. And at this moment, I'm wishing we were sitting in a pub where we could rant about it. <laughs> because a lot of people don't get it. And a lot of mean people don't get it. And, you know, it really, am I allowed? To swear, it really does. Piss oh, me. please do, because I yeah. haven't. I've been well behaved. Please put it do, Lucy. Right I'm <laughs> dying for it. <laughs> I could put it more strongly. And, you know, it's not, it's impossible to avoid that term completely. I describe myself as a mental health professional because that's what people, mm. that's what I am, the mental health system, that's what it's called. Mm. Actually, I think it's quite sinister. And I do, like you, tend to see this as a sign of. You know, but even 10 or 20 years ago, we generally tended to understand that there were a small group of people who were mentally ill. Obviously, yeah. I don't like them either, but they were kind of safely kind of locked away in hospitals and things, and the rest of us were normal. Yeah. But this creeping medicalization of the whole population, whereby we're encouraged to medicalize ourselves and say yes. we all have mental health. I mean, what the hell does that mean? It's absolutely meaningless. Mm. It is quite sinister. So, as you say, we're turning ordinary human experiences. I'm depressed, I'm fed up, I'm miserable, I'm desperate, I'm suicidal into the language of mental health. And in doing that, just as surely as with diagnostic language, we are disconnecting the emotional response from the reasons for that. So, instead of talking about, you know, we can see this in relation to COVID, can't we? Instead of. And that's another thing that drives me absolutely crazy. Tsunami of mental, I can see from your in breath you feel the same. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the horrendous bad luck of having a mental health pandemic following hot on the heels of a pandemic of a deadly virus. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous as though this is somehow some separate additional thing. Yeah. And 
actually the research shows, not surprisingly, people who are feeling most crap, if I can put it like that, are people yes, who are in facing positions of enormous financial uncertainty. They've been trapped in flats with young children. You know, they have been very worried about their health. They've suffered bereavements. They are socially isolated. Of course, they're feeling crap. This is Definitely. not a mental health problem. And the solutions are not and should not be mental health solutions. And I really deplore the way a number of professions, including my own, are jumping on this bandwagon and making bids for something. I described it in a recent article. We don't need a single new research study to confirm that being poor, isolated, lonely, jobless and bereaved makes people miserable. We really no. And the solutions do not lie in pills. They lie in what I very much hope will come out of this pandemic, but we don't know if it will, which is a, a fairer, more equal society. So that, that's my rant, David. It's a bit like yours. So, yeah, um, and, and I appreciate it. I really do. Um, it's what I wanted to say too. Um, and, and thank you for that. I, um, I blame Harry and Megan. <laughs> <laughs> You're really not helping. Go away. Go away and make a Netflix video. <laughs> yeah. Do you not think that the media are using Harry and Meghan so that we don't have to look at what this socioeconomic divide and this yeah. stigma... Everybody's using it. I mean, not necessarily consciously. People get caught up in yeah. these narratives, which is why critical thinking is yeah. so important. Everybody's using it, and some people are using it quite cynically. Totally and utterly. Totally and utterly. And... Lucy, when you think about um, <clears throat> this term mental health and that whole bloody stigma that comes along with it, it's this othering of people, isn't it? And I read um, again on Twitter today, somebody had posted something about the, the is it magazine, The New Yorker, and there's a thing today saying about how we actually are also medicalizing our language and saying yeah well he's got he's got bpd that's definitely narcissism and you're just like why where did one where did the hell did you read it and two who put you on the stool to start judging what's wrong with your neighbor he might just be pissed off because he ain't got any money you know who are you to decide sorry no i've got one of my rants but <laughs> who are you to decide what where, where did we get this in in society that we are now actually all diagnosing each other all the time and it becomes actually that insult doesn't it you know it's yes yeah, do you find it actually quality. really insulting yeah. it is it's insulting but worse than that it's kind of dangerous because we lose sight of you know what is going wrong mm. so that you know if current trends continue, every single person in the country is going to be on a clinic waiting list yeah. and get a diagnosis and meanwhile be prescribed a pill. You know, yeah. so yes. point, I would hope that people, some of us, are going to stop and think, what is it about this society we live in that's making everyone so miserable and are these really the solutions? Mm. Yes, definitely. That's certainly the way we seem to be going. Yeah. And um, when you look at um, trauma, um, and um, and I, I we briefly spoke about this before, so I'll throw it in. This this fact of when you know people come in and say, well, I th there must be something wrong with me because X, Y, and Z happened to me, and I react like this. And my response is always, oh great, you know, it sounds if like you've really been protecting yourself really well. And mm -hmm. that really people are like, oh. Oh, so I'm not wrong then. There's, there's nothing wrong with me. Well, it might not be very helpful in how you're integrating into society right now, but no, you, you are designed biologically to protect yourself and that's what you've done. So that's great that you've used that as your coping mechanism, isn't it? What do you want to change about that? What's not helpful to you in that anymore? And, and I think that this whole, the, you know, the trauma, it's now become an industry, isn't it? You know, we've had yeah. mindfulness and yeah. I think we're heading towards muck compassion, but we're definitely have, heading towards muck trauma. I'm dying to see what person's going to write about this. I'm literally sat waiting to see what he's going to write next. But it is, it's just this, how, why are we industrialising the fact that people got hurt? Yeah, well, it's... You know, actually, trauma is another tricky word, isn't it? And, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of a lot of the trauma-informed stuff. You know, I think yeah. it's 
the most important and most credible alternative to the medical model. It's actually evidence-based. It actually has implications on how to work with people and support people. Definitely. As you say, you know, the central message is the things that psychiatry will call symptoms are best seen as survival strategies. And it would not be let's medicate these away because of the symptoms of an illness, but let's validate and honour these ways that you that you had to survive. Thank God you did. Thank good yeah. you you did use those strategies. Mm. Maybe not all of them are still necessary. Maybe we can find a way of leaving some of them behind if they're not serving you. That's a mm. really good message. But I mean, predictably, I think you're right. You know, we are turning everything into a kind of rather clinical trauma language, such that yeah. trauma becomes a thing you have, and, and it too becomes disconnected from its roots, which are in you know, I don't need to tell you this, but, you know, the horrendously high incidence of childhood sexual abuse and domestic yeah. violence and, yeah. you know, broader than that, poverty and discrimination and so on. You know, okay. that, that comes from, isn't it? That's where it comes from. Totally and utterly. And yeah. David, I think that probably lends itself very nicely to the questions that you wanted to ask um, Lucy around your other Who favourite is... subject. <laughs> well, yeah, um... I wanted to talk about electroconvulsive, electroconvulsive therapy because my father was subject to it back in the 70s and 80s and I saw the mm -hmm. change in a person there. But there is one thing I wanted to ask um, if we could fit it in. Um, I, I read your interview with um, Always After. Um, <laughs> there, was some, yeah, there were some returned comments, uh, one of them by Sir Robin Murray. Yeah, yeah. And he says, um, and he's referring to um, the movement itself, uh, and he infers that we're arguing against a type of psychiatry which became extinct years ago. Um, and that sort of set me back a little bit because I don't think in my experience they've actually moved that far away from, as you said earlier on, where we were about a hundred years ago? No, haven't moved any anywhere at all. <laughs> I mean, it was a very bizarre experience because, I mean, Awas, who I hadn't met, we had a kind of email discussion, made it very clear that he disagreed profoundly and strongly with everything I, I said. I sort of picked that up in the interview. He kind of picked that up. <laughs> and then, without asking me, asked Robin Murray, probably most powerful British psychiatrist and Alan Francis, probably the most powerful American, indeed, world psychiatrist to come and on at the end and say that I've been talking rubbish. I mean, this is very poor journalistic practice. He didn't mm. tell me going to do that. And the justification was I'd misquoted them, but nobody was able, he wasn't able to tell me how I'd misquoted them. Mm. Anyway, it takes more than three powerful psychiatrists to Absolutely. shut them. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, it leads me to the, the question was, um, again, and I know there's so much to cram in here. There's so many directions that I'd like this to go, but I know we're limited on time. Um, yeah, yeah. I can stay here all day. Um, where do you think we are then as a, as a movement? And I include me in that. I say where we are in trying to turn this huge tanker around. You know? Um, so it's canal. It's topical, isn't yeah, it? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> if we use the word movement very loosely, as I assume you are, because there is yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hate the way this is sometimes described anti-psychiatry. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, one of the mm -hmm. athletes from from the seventies. I don't identify as anti-psychiatry. Mm. Some say I'm pro evidence. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, but broadly speaking, there is a movement of which. We all apart, it sounds like, as is a disorder for everyone, as is the mad in America. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, it's various subsidiaries, as are lots and lots of people, most of whom have appeared in one form or another at the uh, A Disorder for Everyone events. And I, I actually have a very optimistic view of this. I mean, I think this is, as I said a few minutes ago, a crumbling paradigm. You know, if mm -hmm. the Gnostic the foundation on which biomedical model psychiatry is based is, you know, as is admitted even by people like Robin Murray and Alan Francis, interestingly, you know, mm -hmm. slagging me off uh, behind my back and suddenly appearing at the end of my interview, they are actually admitting that these are not scientifically based categories. I mean, whatever they are, they're not stupid. They know this is rubbish. 
reach. And they also, I think, are strategically aware that to a certain point, it's up to their interest to kind of admit that, but I mean, they're not letting go of the whole model. But the diagnostic substrate is, you know, the, the foundation on which the whole house is built. If these are not valid scientific categories, which they're not, says the very people who draw them up, mm. everything else follows from that. Why do we need doctors, you know, as primary leaders of teams and so on? Why do we need nurses? Why do we need hospitals as opposed to asylums, safe places? Why are we so over reliant on what they call medication, what I would call drugs? Why, you know, do we have hospitals over the place? Why do we have this medicalized language? It's like pulling the thread of a jumper. And I think that's happening. I think that's happening. Mm -hmm. Dis disappearing down the plug hole without any of us needing to do anything much, but mm -hmm. it's quite fun to give it a great big shove. Yeah. The reason and shoving you are brilliantly so. <laughs> yeah. Many people, not just me, but, uh, but there is an opportunity to get in there with something different because, of course, the danger is, and this also sometimes happens historically, doesn't it? Someone else comes up with some other ludicrously, you know, damaging and inappropriate paradigm instead. Yeah. What we need to get do is to get in there with something different and mm -hmm. already see how the things that are different, like form informed approaches, are. Mm -hmm hastily being kind of revamped in order to be, as you said, turn into muck trauma or <laughs> muck medicate of some yeah. sort. We need to be really, really careful to avoid that happening. And the yeah. power threat meaning framework, if I can mention it briefly. Yeah, I was bring it up. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget ECT is, um, you know, it's not, we're not saying this is the paradigm shift that we need. We are saying this is an a very ambitious attempt to outline the next step down the road, mm. which is not based on medical assumptions. And, which, um, you know, it's a set of principles. It's not a kind of manual for how to do things, but it's a way of putting, uh, you know, something that is in trauma informed and narrative based, but is also broader than that on the kind of firmer evidence based footing, but also uh, like based on principles that include the most important forms of evidence, which is actually what real life people say about their, their real life. Indeed, and I was most impressed by the collaboration that you had with service users and, and, and their stories, their narrative. Indeed, it's a co-produced document. Although I, I think the question that, um, that comes up for me is that, and I do believe that we are in a shift and, you know, you know, I'm not a Freud fan. I'm going to lay it out there. Not a Freud fan. But you know what? I'm really pleased that Freud was there because it, it, it gave precedence to creating, you know, therapeutic settings, you know, so I can see what he gave. And I, but my question is now, so we've had a hundred years, yeah? So my question now is, what about everybody sat out there that thinks, well, okay then, if I haven't got an order <laughs> at the end of something, how do I get support? Where's my funding? How do I get support for my child, you know, that's sat in school and, and is just not being heard unless they've got an order? Um, how do how do we answer that, Lucy? How how do we say to them that in this 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 new framework, which absolutely you know I absolutely has to come, but how does that transition happen? Because at the end of the day, we do rely on funding. Yeah. <clears throat> Chapter eight of the main document of the framework, we've looked at some of this. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're right. We live in a diagnostically based world, so kind of. Pulling out that bit of it has all sorts of implications wider than services as such for funding, mm. commissioning, for support at school, for children who are struggling, for access to welfare and benefits and so on and so on. So, I mean, the very you know simple thing to say is obviously people's needs must come first. So mm. I feel, help many people, many clients fill in their benefits forms and I'm perfectly happy to put a silly label in a box if it helps someone to get what they yeah. need. What I would hope to do is have a really honest conversation with the person and say, this is not actually how I see you or how we're seeing it, but it's really important you have access to this service of these benefits. Would you be happy for me to put this? And I would say the same to parents or anything. So we're, we're in a kind of transition stage. Hmm. To, of course, people's real life material needs must be prioritised, but actually when we 
eventually abandon the diagnostic paradigm. We need to kind of do all those things differently. Totally. And those things are not, you know, in some ways these are often presented as, but we can't, we need diagnosis for this. But yeah. I think quite, you know, for example, access to welfare, you know, yeah. the forms you have to fit in. And there's no such thing as diagnosis will guarantee you getting welfare. No. <laughs> and there's, indeed, it's sometimes used to exclude you. Totally. Actually, what the decision is based on is things like, you know, can you be left on a, um, in the house unaided? Can you can you walk 100 yards without falling over? That kind of thing. Yeah. Needs-based assessments, which is essentially what they are, are mm. don't have diagnostic labels attached to them. They have to have a professional kind of confirming them. But some of these problems are not as difficult to solve as people might think. Great. Thanks for that clarification, because I think that is, you know, I get asked it a lot. Um, and I just think, actually, I think that's um, a brilliant answer. I shall point them to this video once it's out. <laughs> As Dr. Lucy Johnston says, should we go back to that um, ECT? I am equally as interested in how that is still, still in our society. Somebody, um, again, this is me on Twitter, somebody that had, I think they were in a talk with, with you, um, Lucy, was saying, you know, um, there was a comparison between the effects of, of how um, ECT, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying yes or no, but is, is comparable to the effects of severe epilepsy. I had severe epilepsy as a child, and I know I've got an incredibly, and David knows me very well, an incredibly wonky brain. Um, and I cannot, I cannot imagine... Do you know what I mean? I got that through illness. I cannot imagine how, how that could be deemed to be helpful to anybody. I, I, no. I really, I'm, like I said, I've not experienced it. I've not witnessed it. I don't have David's lived experience of it or anybody else's, but I just kind of think I can't imagine if somebody did that to my brain when I know <coughs> the struggle mm. that I have with my, my brain. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... A common sense view, which is what I very often hear from people. People nearly always say, firstly, they're surely not doing that still, are they? Yeah. Of course they are. Secondly, they nearly always say, but that's barbaric, isn't it? To which I nearly always say, yes, it is. And anyone with any experience of epilepsy, direct or indirect, will know that generally it is accepted that epileptic fits are not good for the brain. Now, how you can have a neurologist in one part of the hospital trying to reduce the number of fits someone has, while a few yards away in another part of the hospital, someone is saying, OK, we're going to put this shot through your brain, which actually is many times more powerful than the electrical firing that happens during an epileptic fit. Mm. And you're going to come out round with all the signs of concussion, which, again, in another part of the hospital, in A&E, we take very seriously. <laughs> going to feel nauseous, you're going to feel confused, you, your memory may be lost, and we're going to tell you, great, this was really good for you, and because we're giving you a course, we're going to give you eight more. I mean, it, it defies common sense, it defies professional knowledge, it's, you know, it's unethical on every single level, and I remain astonished, I am absolutely astonished and outraged that anyone can possibly defend it, but you'll see from Twitter there's a massive backlash against our challenge to ECT, which has been, yeah. in its latest iteration, has been led by John Reed, who with his, um, his fab. John Reed, who I've known for years, and his, he and his, his team of researchers have done some fantastic stuff. Yeah. Um, what they've done, it's simple, but it's so effective, is that because there is no standard monitoring of ECT, there's no clear collection of data. There is, no. I didn't even know this till recently, the Royal College of Psychiatrists boasts about, you know, tightly regulated, accredited. You don't even have to be an accredited clinic to offer ECT. And the accreditation standards are minimal. They're in-house. They're optional. And they're not, what they find is not even reported anywhere. It's not reported to the Care Quality Commission, for example. If you're doing very badly in your clinic, all they say is try and do better. You don't even have to apply to be told that. So what... I mean, it's, it, you know, shopping is the only word you can use. So John Reed and his colleagues most recently did an, a kind of audit of ECT based on freedom information requests, because it's the only way to get all the information. My own the trust that I used to work in, which is local to me in Bristol, had the 
very unwelcome distinction of giving ECT 40 times more, more, 47 times more often per head of the population than the lowest using trust. So just imagine if we found that a particular trust was, you know, carrying out 47 times more mastectomies or, you know, had 40 times higher levels of death rate or in some branch of its services. It, it, there'd be a national scandal, be a national scandal. So all this stuff has come out, and the one thing that you will see none of the people defending ECT on Twitter doing is actually addressing those issues. They're, they're not that. It's all about you're shaming the people who've had ECT, and you've never worked with people who've had ECT. You know, I have worked with probably, because I've spent a lot of time working in patient wards, I've literally come across hundreds of people who've had ECT, because it's an interest of mine. I've spent many hours talking to many, many people in depth about their experiences of ECT. I've carried out a research study into it. I know a lot about it. And that's the other thing that, you know, but you don't have to have that kind of justification to have an opinion about it. You know, it, it is absolutely disgraceful. And they are not wise. Strategically, the Royal College is not wise to start defending it. They recently played the same game with so-called antidepressants. No, yeah. people don't have withdrawal effects. No, they're not addictive. They've been forced to back down and now they're kind of you know patting themselves on the back for being so kind of open-minded and uh you know and being so willing to kind of think about how to support people who come off antidepressants but they need to do strategically apart from any other reason they need to do the same about ect or else it's really really not going to look good for them e ect not and i'm so sorry your dad went through that david i don't know what he's yeah um it, his experience is doing very day, but Fortunately, I don't remember a great deal, and, and my experience in uh, dealing with trauma, um, I equate it with the fact that you know I, it did traumatise me because I've buried it so deeply that it's very difficult for me to access uh, the memory. It comes back to me from time to time, but you know, I remember a very outgoing. Um, you know, a part of his illness was that he was aggressive. So there's that part of it too. And sometimes it was relief that he'd come back absolutely like a zombie. And that's the only way I can describe it. Um, but it was scary at the same time because this fella that's held down quite a manual job and quite a technical job and was very vocal to say the least, he sat there like a cabbage for weeks on end, mm -hmm. time after time. Um, and I could see no benefit when he actually came out of it, but mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're, they're very, um, the memories come and go, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they've obviously left their impact on me, um, and the well, family. That, yeah, that's, I mean, I discovered in the last couple of months, I've discovered that two of my quite close friends had parents who'd had ECT and I didn't know that. and. They were saying rather similar things to you. What a, well, you know, we've got to remember it's not just the effect on the person, is it? It's the people. Oh, around. it's the family, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's um, unforgivable, in my view. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it's only till I got started to train and I got into um, becoming counsellor, psychotherapist, that um, I realised it was still going on. I, I thought it had been... Yeah stopped years and years and years ago yeah yeah well about two and a half thousand people a year still get ect i, I read your numbers yeah 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 mostly um older women who mm. have you know older people's brains are more vulnerable and mm. older women in particular may have more reasons for feeling really miserable about their life yeah you lot go through your bloody menopause yeah you feel <laughs> sorry i just had to get that in i'm still um, beginning it yeah, i'm still waiting yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, Lucy, I, I honestly, I cannot thank you enough. It's, you know, without sounding too starstruck, you know, I admire your work so much and I admire you as a woman. Bloody good on you. You know, you do take <laughs> flack on Twitter and it is misogynist. And I am all for a really good debate as long as you've got your evidence. But if you want to get, get your insults out, do you know what? Go on a football field and shout them out. Then come back in and have a proper debate. 
Mm. Because we're not going to get anywhere if we just... I said recently about social media, it literally has become the village stocks, hasn't it? And it, this little tribal behavior comes popping up. And I know I'm going to throw some squash tomatoes at Lucy Johnson, you know, I don't know who she is, but you know, I'm just going to have a go because my friend on Twitter, five pages down has, and it's stop doing it. Actually listen to what Dr. Lucy Johnson says. And, um, <laughs> You know, if you don't mind, women and doctors, <laughs> my little thing. Um, but if you don't mind, actually listen, watch the research that she has gained through experience, knowledge, and the fact that she's actually put her head to the grindstone and done her work. And then come back and have a decent debate because we can't change anything without debate because unfortunately the world isn't an echo chamber is it we can't just say well because lucy's right and that's the end of it you know we've got to meet in the middle somewhere and bring that conversation in more but get rid of the insults please just thought thank you well, you're well, welcome people are going to take notice of that we'll see <laughs> i'm very arsy <laughs> I, I i prove that i prove that women should speak up you know, so should men, but not at the expense of women, obviously. No, definitely not. Definitely not. David, I mean, we could, couldn't we? We could sit here all day. Yeah, and, and I, I realise you know, Lucy's time is, is precious. Exactly. And, um, and I am so grateful. Uh, this has been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. So thank you. Lovely um, to meet you both. Maybe you see you at the festival. <laughs> yeah, um, you will now that I've got my academic baggage out the way and um, from last year i hope to be more involved and, and 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 become more knowledgeable around it all and and hope that i can apply myself somewhere somehow excellent great lovely to speak to you both no thank you thank you very okay. much and thank you everybody for watching and all the information about lucy and the fest upcoming festival will be down in the resources as well so you can book your places. <laughs> Thank you.